So I just wanted to start off that I've got no uh, real or perceived conflicts to declare, so not paid by the pharmaceutical or the tobacco industry um, in this space. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of the Alfred Health experience because we're really well known for our work in this area, but I think what's really important is for us to be able to share that it hasn't always been like that. We've had a whole lot of challenges, we've had a whole lot of barriers along the way, um, and uh, it's, it's really important to acknowledge that, that this has been a journey of many, many years. So we're a really large Metro Health system in Melbourne. Um, so we see about 110,000 uh, patients every year as an inpatient admission and we're also a really big employer. So for us when we're looking at any of our work in the area of prevention and preventive health, uh, we like to focus on our environment, our clinical interactions, so what we're doing with our patients, but also what we're doing around our workforce. Um, and that's a, a consideration that we, we um, use across many of our prevention health topics. So this is a picture of, of Alfred Health back in uh, 2008 in the top left-hand corner and uh, today in the top right-hand corner. So, sorry, left-hand corner, right-hand corner, sorry. So the, the biggest difference in this is obviously our designated smoking area and that that's now been removed. So this is our major courtyard within our health service. Um, it is a courtyard that is used by most staff and patients at Alfred Health. Um, but we've come a long way from our journey of having this huge structure within one of our most prominent places within our health service to, to removing that. So we went smoke-free as a health service back in 2008, and this was prior to any legislation in Victoria uh, to be smoke-free. So we had a CEO at the time who was all about doing things super quickly, to the extent that she was actually called Nike, because she just said, just get on and do it. So she actually gave us three months to go from having designated smoking areas to being smoke free. So this was a really rapid transition for us. So the objectives of this particular part of our smoke free journey were around reducing exposure to, pa to passive smoke for our patients, our visitors, our contractors and our staff, but also to demonstrate public leadership. So our actions for this particular part of our journey were around policy, were around communication and were around signage. So not surprisingly, when we came to look at what impact did it have, it didn't actually have quite a lot. So we had high awareness because structures were being pulled down, signage was going up, there was a whole lot of buzz about what was happening, but we still had a whole lot of uh, uh, non-compliance on site from both staff and from patients. And we weren't doing anything differently to support our patients or our staff who smoked. So this is just a little clip, I'm hoping it might work. Um, and this is uh, our Executive Director of Nursing Services talking about um, our experience with Smoke Free. As a leading Australian healthcare provider, Alfred Health is committed to creating a totally smoke-free environment for all. We're really proud to be Victoria's first major metro health service to introduce a totally smoke-free environment. It's really important for us that our patients, our staff, contractors and visitors come to our hospital and enjoy a healthy, safe environment. Since we started supporting patients to quit, smoking around the main campus perimeter has reduced by a third and there's been a reduction of more than 85% in the number of patients observed smoking. along with our, our smoking journey from, from doing not, not a lot, doing things around signage and policy, um, until in 2011 we actually had an involuntary patient within Alfred Health take us to VCAT, um, citing an infringement of her human right to not be able to smoke while she was an involuntary mental health consumer. This was a really pivotal moment for our organisation. We had a new CEO at this time um, who'd come from the UK, really strong in prevention over there, particularly smoking, and he was keen for us to go through this uh, challenge. Um, but there are other people within our executive who weren't so keen. But in any case, he got his way and we went through this, this legal challenge. And what came out of this was, was really quite instrumental for Alfred Health, but also for a lot of other organisations within Victoria, was that they, there was no human right to smoke. But as a health service, being smoke free, pre-legislation, it was not okay for us to put patients in a smoke free environment uh, where we know that they have an addiction, they have a dependency and not to support them. 
So basically we came with a new approach in 2012 and you can see from this that our objectives now are so much broader than what they were initially. We still care about minimising exposure to secondhand smoke. We still want to be seen as having a public leadership role, but now we wanted to look at, it, at how do we facilitate smoking cessation among our patients and how do we facilitate it among our staff. And we also needed to recognise that as a health service, there are going to be patients whereby we will be looking to manage temporary abstinence. So they weren't interested in quitting, but they had an addiction and we needed to clinically manage that to make them as comfortable as possible while they're in a smoke-free environment. We also wanted to denormalise de smoking. So we wanted to prevent uptake, which sounds bizarre, but we actually had several patients coming to our mental health service non-smokers and leave as smokers. So they were looking at kicking other drugs and so forth while they were there, uh, and they took up smoking tobacco um, in its place. And we also recognise that for a lot of people, um, the risk of relapse is high when they can visually see people smoking or they can smell tobacco smoke. So it's important for us to recognise as a health service that we had a role to play in denormalising smoking. So this time our actions were still around communication, but our actions were also looking at the clinical management of nicotine dependency. And it's a bit wordy and it sounds a, a, a bit strange, but for us it was really important for us to get our clinicians and our health professionals to see that smoking just wasn't a public health issue, that it was a clinical issue and we had to manage it. So we made sure that when we framed that terminology, it resonated with our health professionals. And it was all supported by a really robust clinical guideline um, that had input from every head of unit within our health service. Obviously, education was also a really important component of what we did. So what happened with this reinvigorated approach? Well, we had high awareness again, but interestingly, we had increased compliance, even though we weren't focusing as much on it. So we had that reduced smoking around our campus perimeter. And being a big major metro health service, you know, people are always looking at us, there's always news crews out the front. Um, for us, it was really important not to have people having a ciggy in the background of, you know, of, of uh, news reports and so forth. So for us, that was a really important leverage point because our executive cared about that, our board cared about that, um, and so we were able to demonstrate that when we started to support our patients who smoked, we had a significant reduction in perimeter-based smoking. And also as a health service, we were able to achieve best practice clinical management in the area. So what got us to this point? What were our, our enablers this second time around? Well, by far and large, it was organisational leadership, strong leadership from our CEO, strong leadership by our primary care and population health board subcommittee and, uh, and the Alfred Health Board. We very much saw it as a problem that needed a solution. We communicated publicly and actively so our patients and our staff expected it to happen and would challenge us when it didn't. And it wasn't so much about why we should be doing this, it was why and how can we not. We know that smoking is the largest preventable cause of death and disease in Australia. How is it okay as a leading health service that we're not taking this seriously, that we're not doing something to support our workforce and to support our patients and communities to quit smoking. Our clinical leadership was also a really, really big strength um, and we committed to best practice. So it was particularly challenging at this time, this was back in 2011, 2012, and, and uh, the whole idea of using what we call combination <coughs> nicotine replacement therapy was well known, certainly within Australia. So people were looking and thinking, oh, what are you doing? It, it seems that what we were doing was, was really quite different to what was happening through the rest of the country. But we made that commitment to best practice and made sure the education supported it. We allocated resources, so people and pharmaceutical, but the number of people that we actually allocated to this initiative was quite low. We looked to wherever possible, integrate it within existing clinical practice and integrate these conversations into conversations that were already taking place. And we wanted to have support for patients and for staff who smoke, so the two together. Education was a huge enabler and for us it was around looking at opportunities for education where we could slip ourselves in to current things in place. So for our nursing workforce, they use a lot of online learning. 
So it was about creating an online le learning package that sat within that platform that our nursing staff were used to using. The opportunity for grand rounds to get that broad influence across the health service and so forth. So really using those channels that already exist rather than creating a whole new process for education on smoking, which just wasn't going to work. And we had a continuous improvement focus. So we had to find ways that we could measure our performance and to innovate and test new approaches, always with a long-term focus. So our clinical leadership is, is probably one of the most pivotal parts of our journey. Um, and we had the experience back in 2011 when, when things weren't going so great for us in this space where everyone thought it was everyone else's responsibility. So you talk to the doctors and they say it was the nurse's responsibility to talk to patients about smoking. You talk to the nurses, they say it's the doctors. Occasionally it'd be the social workers or the physios. Um, but effectively, because it was perceived as no one's responsibility, nothing ever happened. To the extent where only 14% of our patients were asked about smoking. And 1% of that 14% were offered any support to manage or quit. So that was our baseline performance, pretty poor. So we needed to make sure that we had a discipline who this sat with, this clearly defined clinical leadership. We had to integrate it within existing practice. Number one, to make sure that we weren't asking for a whole lot of cash from the organisation, because again, that wasn't going to happen, but also to ensure the sustainability of this into the future. And we had to make it systematic, every person, every time, especially in those areas of greatest challenge, whether it be mental health, whether it be maternity, for us, it's also our HIV uh, cohorts being a, a HIV statewide service. We wanted to measure our performance. We needed to normalise the practice. This is just a part of what we do as health professionals working in a health service. And we used a lot of campaigns like our Start the Conversation campaign developed with the Victorian government to really emotionally compel health professionals. So to use the patient voice, the consumer voice about why we should actually be doing this uh, rather than you know, stats or evidence. So when it came to our clinical management of nicotine dependency, the clinical leadership, we actually uh, had that sit with our pharmacists. So we have a, a bit of a different model within the health service that I work in, in that our pharmacists are actually linked to a medical service. So when our ortho doctors round, our pharmacists round with them. So our pharmacists see patients, you know, within 10, 15 minutes of admission to our ED. Um, they see them throughout their stay and at the point of discharge. So it's a model that works well for us. Um, but again, it's choosing, I suppose, a model that will work well for the organisation. And there's been both nursing and medical models in other uh, Victorian health services uh, with great results as well. So we wanted to ensure that our pharmacists were able to prescribe nicotine replacement therapy. We also wanted to be able to make sure that our nurses could prescribe nicotine replacement therapy. And I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully explain to you um, the role of that and how important that is in, in the success of a smoke-free policy in a minute. Um, and it was all obviously within a treatment algorithm. So we had a clinical guideline, it had a treatment algorithm, it was very easy for our medical, nursing, pharmacists to be able to follow. We also wanted to make sure that we had all forms of nicotine replacement therapy available and that would be on the impress of every single ward in the health service. So that there was quick, easy access to these products without the delay of ordering and supply from the pharmacy department. We also recognise that as a health service, we see people generally for a very short period of their time. So what were we doing for them following discharge? And then there were very other, uh, various other initiatives around support for patients pre-surgery, support for staff, and also a specialist outpatient service. So this is just uh, a little patient story. Um, so I will try and get this one to work too. Led by our pharmacists, Alfred Health provide patients with support before, during and after admission, helping patients who smoke to quit. Quitting cigarettes is very hard and it's not good for your health and it's very expensive. And the support from the Alfred was excellent. While I was trying to quit smoking, I didn't think I could do it on my own. From this, we found our inpatients are four times more likely to quit than those who received no support. Our outpatient smoke-free clinic cessation rates are in the order of 42%. And over 95% of our patients who smoke are now identified and offered support to quit. This has been a really important initiative for us. We're committed to helping patients who smoke to quit and ensuring those that do don't start again. I 
Okay, so as it kind of highlighted in, in that short little video, um, what we've been able to achieve by really embedding this within what we do has been really great. So we've been able to increase the provision of best practice support from 14% to more than 95% and it's maintained there for the last four years. And we've also been able to show that our patients are four times more likely to quit. So we're getting roughly a quit rate of about 15 to 17% among our inpatients. And when we look at our smoke-free outpatient service, uh, we're getting quit rates of about 42%. So the patients we typically see through our clinic are patients who are at very, very high risk of chronic disease. They may be clients who may need transplantation down the track. They are clients that may need home oxygen, um, maternity patients, oncology patients, patients with mental health and so forth. So it really is, I suppose, a face-to-face -face outpatient clinic really targeting uh, that quite complex uh, group who stand to, to bear quite a lot of the burden of, of chronic disease. Um, our Stop Before the Op initiative is probably one of the things I'm most proud of in it and it really just shows how something can be so easily integrated within what we do already. Um, and we, when it comes to surgical patients, most health services will have what we call a pre-admission clinic where uh, clients and patients will come in prior to their surgery, particularly those with uh, significant risks of chronic disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, cardiac uh, history and so forth. So what we did is we integrated a brief intervention for smoking cessation within that appointment. So it's only a conversation that takes about one or two minutes we ask them about smoking, we talk to them about particularly the benefits of quitting preoperatively, so improvements in wound healing, improvements in uh, decreasing length of stay, uh, also looking at things like uh, better managed pain post-operative and so forth. So looking at those particularly teachable moments within that setting to encourage people to, to think about giving quitting a go. They were provided with pharmacotherapy, so medicine to support a quit attempt, plus behavioural support, and we were able to increase the number of patients who made a quit attempt prior to surgery from 11% to 53%, so it quadrupled. So more than half of the patients who were smokers, who came into a pre-admission clinic, who were having surgery, accepted the offer of support and tried to make a quit attempt. And when we looked at how many of these people were actually smoke-free on the day of surgery, uh, it was about 23%. So about one in four had actually stopped. And for us, this particular initiative was easy to integrate. It was only a conversation that took a minute or so. Um, and I must say these results were also what we call biochemically verified. So we used a carbon monoxide monitor to be able to demonstrate that these just weren't self-reported results. These were actually um, biochemically verified. Now, a good news for smokers initiative is only something we've had in, in the pipe work for the last few years, and this is our model to support our staff who smoke. And if I have my time again in this space, um, it's something that I would have done much early be, because the actual um, the movement amongst our workforce has been just so powerful since we actually said to them, hey, we care about you, your health and wellbeing. We want to provide you fully funded, fully supported best practice support as a staff member to quit smoking. And our staff members are reporting that the conversations that then they're having with patients and clients are so much more powerful. They don't feel like the hypocrite. They don't feel like the one that's preaching what they haven't done. Um, and I think this is really interesting as an organisation to look at investing into the, the health and wellbeing of the staff. So for us, it was about 4.5% of our population, uh, uh, sorry, of our workforce who smoked. So we've had several hundred staff through this program now, and we've got some quit rates. Our most recent ones, uh, which are a little bit, the figures are a little bit different to, since we, when we produced this, um, but there's about 60, 62% of our staff who are actually smoke free that have been part of this campaign. And as an employer, this is really important because we do know that staff who smoke, there are costs to the organisation as far as increased absenteeism and loss of productivity due to smoking breaks. So there's definitely benefits as an organisation, as an employer, to invest in this space. Alfred Health aims to create a workplace that promotes health and wellbeing, recognising the vital link between staff health and outstanding patient care. Tobacco smoking impacts our staff our patients and us as employers and is a leading preventable cause of death and disease in Australia. But the costs of smoking go beyond health. Our 2016 staff health check 
told us that approximately 4.5% of our 8,000 plus employees smoked. Through our Good News for Smokers initiative, staff had access to nicotine replacement therapy, face-to-face -face or phone consultations, group consultations, as well as emails and texts. And it worked. Up to 50% of the staff who joined became smoke-free. Quitting smoking turned out to be a lot easier than I thought it would be and I wish I had done it sooner. I feel great now and I've felt supported by the staff members throughout the entire process. And not only that, many of them have actually banded together for additional support throughout their quit journey, which is fantastic, and motivated other staff within their departments to try and quit as well. Okay, so we've kind of highlighted that perimeter-based smoking is, uh, is something that health services care about. So uh, one of the super fun things that my team do is we actually walk around the perimeter and count people who smoke um, and classify them as staff visitors or contractors. But it's a way for us to be able to demonstrate that, that what we're doing in this space is, is progressing, that we're starting to see improvement. So what, I suppose, has been our, our improvement focus? Well, we've made sure that since the beginning we've had a clear definition of what success means. So we needed to have a success, that, uh, a definition that was beyond compliance. We didn't want to see one person smoking out the front of the hospital and think, oh my gosh, the whole policy doesn't work, let's get to stop, stop doing it. And when I was um, at Royal Perth this morning, you know, one of, one of the staff there kind of likened uh, this to hand hygiene. You know, we, we, we often don't achieve 100%, but do we say, oh, well, uh, because we only got 95, we're not going to bother up with hand hygiene. But for some reason, when it comes to smoking policies within health services, if we don't achieve 100% compliance, if we see one person smoking, we like to deem it a failure. But it's really important that we have that focus, that the evidence of problems does not mean a policy is inappropriate, it does not mean it's a failure, it just shows us that we need to have that continuous improvement focus and keep working in that space. A big uh, thing that we've learned along the way is consistency, and I know that this is a particular challenge within the, the WA system, particularly within mental health. So what we know happens is that when there is an inconsistent message about smoking, one uh, staff member may allow a patient to go off site to smoke or smoke within a courtyard where you know, you're not supposed to, um, and there's inconsistency, it can lead to aggression. And this is a really, really big topic in Melbourne and Victoria, especially after the cardiothoracic surgeon uh, was brutally assaulted and unfortunately passed away after talking to someone who smoked. So it's really important to think about the consistent message that we're giving to patients and understand that inconsistency, whether it be about smoking or whatever else it might be, may lead to, to aggression and, and irritability among patients, which is completely understandable. We know that there's inequalities in smoking. We know that there's certain priority populations that experience more of the health and financial hardships that come with smoking. So it doesn't make sense as health professionals, as health services, to also have inequalities in quitting. And again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the mental health setting, and, and, and that's just particularly because uh, the literature is just so robust in that space. But we know that those patients, we know that those clients experience more of the disease burden that comes with smoking. We know that they're more likely to experience financial hardship due to smoking. So to offer them less support so to not give them the same opportunity to quit smoking as the general population is just not the way we want to go about it. So we made sure that our approach did not end up having inequalities in quitting. So the same support, if not more, was put into those areas of greatest challenge and high smoking prevalence. We also wanted to make sure that it just didn't keep sitting as an OH&S issue, that it stayed up there on the radar as a clinical issue. And as I said before, particularly in these areas in preventive health, we want to use a little bit of evidence, but we want to use a whole lot of emotion. So the patient story, the consumer voice, I expect you as my health professional, I expect you as a health service to care about my health and wellbeing. So smoking and pregnancy, and, and, and probably none of this is, um, is foreign to you guys, but um, we've got to remind ourselves it is the most important preventable risk factor for poor maternal and infant health outcomes. And when we look at the Australian figures, we're seeing about 11% of pregnant women smoke at some point during their pregnancy. 
and that brings increased risks, miscarriage, stillbirth, prematurity, low birth weight, perinatal morbidity and mortality. And we know that children of smoking mums are more likely to smoke themselves. We know that rates are significantly higher in high priority populations such as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population and socially disadvantaged women. And the more cigarettes smoke, the greater the risk of complications and the greater the risk of low birth weight. But the good news is quitting in pregnancy and especially during that first trimester reduces the risk of birth complications, lowers the risk of having a premature uh, baby and you get the same chance of having a healthy birth weight as a non-smoking mum. And obviously that reduced perinatal and morbidity and mortality. So obviously within that first trimester we've got the mum and the bub stand to have some really great health benefits from quitting smoking. But we know that quitting at any time during the pregnancy produces health benefits. So whenever you're seeing that mum, it's around asking them about their smoking. And we'll go through some strategies around that in a minute because what we know, particularly among pregnant women, is the conversation we have, the way we ask how they smoke, is different to how we ask you know, a non-smoking uh, woman. We also know that cutting down isn't sufficient. And this is something you often hear pregnant mums say, I haven't quit, but I've cut down. And while that's a really great thing as far as they're making a step towards quitting smoking and they're recognising it as you know, something that they want to address, we know that for most of these women, it'll end up in what we call compensatory smoking. So effectively, they smoke the remaining cigarette harder and more intensely to get the same amount of nicotine out of them. And we're seeing that across the population generally as taxation goes up and the legislative smoke-free areas go up and, and people can smoke less in certain areas. We're finding that people will reduce their cigarette consumption but their actual dependency on cigarettes stays the same and it's just because they're smoking those remaining cigarettes differently. So we know that there's particular barriers to quitting in pregnancy and it can be really challenging for pregnant women to quit smoking. First and foremost, it's, it's what we call fast nicotine metabolism. So one of the things that we know, particularly in pregnant women and also women taking the oral contraceptive, is that how quickly their body eliminates nicotine is affected. So what we, we essentially mean by this is pregnant women will get nicotine out of their system faster than a non-pregnant woman. So therefore, we'll seek to replace that nicotine by picking up a cigarette quicker than a non-pregnant woman. So nicotine has a really short half-life as a drug and that's significant and it's even shorter in women that are pregnant. So it's certainly something that we need to consider when we're looking at support for women who are pregnant who would like to quit smoking. We also know that barriers in to quitting in pregnancy can include things like those who have pre-existing mental illness, other substance abuse, stress, um, and there's also those behavioural and psychological dependence uh, drivers of their smoking. So we know people smoke for nicotine, it's an addiction, it's a dependence, but they also smoke because of behaviours and emotions and moods that they have associated with their smoking over many, many years. Um, and that's why it's really important that when we support people to quit smoking, that they have that behavioural support provided by services like Quitline and so forth. Um, certainly we know that if they have a partner or they live with people who smoke, it, make it, it makes it more difficult. So it brings up, well, should we be offering support to their partner? Should we be offering to support to other people they live with quitting smoking? And they also will sometimes bring up concerns about weight gain. So again, important to recognise that it's quite a different dynamic with these women and the conversations need to be tailored to them, particularly around breaking down some of these barriers with smoking. So hopefully we've kind of got the picture that, you know, we don't want our, our mums to, pregnant mums to smoke, um, that they stand to have great benefits for both themselves and, and the baby if they quit. So what are we going to do? As health professionals, what can we actually do? Well, first and foremost, we know that a brief intervention, and by that I mean identifying that someone smokes, offering them or motivating a quit attempt and offering them support, whether it be support provided by you or referring them to someone else for support, makes a difference. It increases quit rates. 
And for those of you who love the number needed to treat, and I do, um, it's one in 33. So what it means is that one in 33 conversations you have with someone about smoking will end up in them quitting. And if you think that this is a conversation that might only take you a couple of minutes for an hour of your time, spread out over a week, two weeks, whatever it might be, one of the people you've spoken to statistically will go on to be smoke free. And I want to put that in the context of something like aspirin, which we use all the time for cardiovascular prevention. Pretty much anyone that's ever had you know, any cardiovascular event or at risk gets put on aspirin. The number needed to treat for that is 1,667. So we do that all the time. It is normal practice for us to do that. But the number needed to treat for smoking is so much less. So the opportunities for us to make a difference are absolutely massive. And again, when we look at the data, it's still us as health professionals that are the greatest trigger to prompting people to make a quit attempt. And we also know that stage of change doesn't matter. So for those of you that may have um, you know, learnt the, the old 5A's model for brief intervention or have heard that you, know, you need to assess a person's willingness to quit, there's actually quite a lot of data coming out about this now showing, don't worry about it, skip that step, which is great when you get told to do less as a health professional. You're like, yes, doesn't happen very often, but we can skip that step. So what we actually know is that people's stage of change changes hour to hour, minute to minute, day to day. So let's just go on and offer everyone support regardless of where they may be at. And this is a lovely study to illustrate it. It's from overseas, it was 1,600 patients. And they basically broke them into two groups. 11% of them said, I want to quit smoking. 89% said, no, nah, not interested. Pretty, pretty uh, replicates what you, you're pretty much seeing in clinical practice if you actually ask people. Most people say, no, nah, not interested. But what they did was they went on to offer them both best practice support, both groups. So 52%, so just over half of those who said, hey, I want to quit, actually took up the offer of support. Can't make everyone happy all the time, but, but it is lower than I would have thought. But what particularly surprised me in this study was that a quarter, 24% of those who said, I am not interested in quitting, took up the offer of support. And when you look at quit rates, and these are short-term quit rates, about 17 weeks, 37% of those who said, I am not interested, had actually quit smoking. So imagine if we just didn't even bother with that group. We didn't even ask that group offer support to that group. We'd be missing a whole lot of the population uh, that we're not offering support to. And we know that it really is the offer of support that is so crucial. This is some GP data, but there's no reason to believe it wouldn't be transferable to other disciplines. But essentially, it's looking at the percentage of people who smoke who tried to quit. So roughly in this study, within a particular year, about a third of them, 30%, said, okay, I'm gonna give quitting smoking a go. Then they looked at the proportion of patients who saw a GP and their GP said nothing about smoking and they looked at the rate of quitting among that group and it was only about 28%. So less patients in that group quit smoking than those who hadn't even seen a GP at all. You ask them why? Well, my GP didn't say anything to me about smoking. If it was serious, if it was you know, related to my health, they would have told me to quit smoking. So it's almost like we're giving them consent to just continue with that behaviour. So I think about so many places within <coughs> health services where we do a tick box exercise. Do you smoke? Do you drink alcohol? And nothing happens. So if they're disclosing to us that they smoke, that they drink at risky levels, what are we saying to them by not advising them about that health behaviour? Also in this particular study, they looked at, okay, well what about those patients where the GP said, hey, you should really quit smoking, and that was it. There's only a tiny increase to about 32% of people that tried to make a quit attempt. And again, you ask people why, and they say, well, I know smoking's bad for me, I can't, you know, I can't avoid that these days, it's on my cigarette pack, it's on the TV, but I don't know how to quit. I've tried before, I've failed. But look what happens when you give support. You get about 60% of people who will go on to make a quit attempt. Similar to what we saw in our pre-admission clinic. So again, it's that offer of support that is just so crucial to what we're doing. 
So when we come to identifying pregnant women who smoke, and, and certainly within your health service thinking about how that happens, we need to look at opportunities to ask, identify and assess at every opportunity we see them, and at least at a very minimum once each trimester. And that ensures that you know, the idea around stopping smoking remains on their radar, it remains important at all parts of their pregnancy, not just at that initial visit. A lot of the time I'll hear clinicians say, oh, well, they're in their third trimester, it doesn't matter. They've missed that opportunity to quit. They've missed you know, the, the benefits, uh, the real big benefits to, to the baby. We also need to recognise that in this particular population, women do find it difficult to disclose their smoking due to stigma. So there's some evidence that's actually been around since the early 90s, um, but is actually not in a lot of health services, certainly in Victoria, is around actually instead of asking do you smoke, having a little bit of a statement type of format like this. Things like I smoke regularly now, about the same as before I found out I was pregnant. I smoke regularly now, but more. I smoke now, but I've cut down. I stopped after I found out I was pregnant and I'm not smoking now. I stopped before I found out I was pregnant and I'm not smoking now and I've never smoked. And by using something like this, it shows that disclosure of smoking can be increased by up to 40%. So it's just interesting to think about you know, that, that perception and, and this really teases out where they are in their, their smoking journey. We also know that there's a role of carbon um, monoxide monitoring and I'm not sure whether this is something that's, that's used within your health service. Effectively, um, the best way I can describe it is like an alcohol breathalyzer for smoking. So we use it in research to biochemically verify results, but it's a well-known motivational tool. And what it does is it immediately and non-invasively invasively looks at expired carbon monoxide, so the crappy gas um, that you know, takes the place of oxygen in the body. And it detects active smoking and it also will detect passive smoking. Um, and you get both a maternal and a fetal carbon monoxide reading um, in both parts per million and carboxylated haemoglobin. And it's a traffic light system. So obviously in the left picture there where the baby's green, the mum and the baby both have no carbon monoxide in, uh, attached to their uh, haemoglobin. Whereas in the right hand picture where the baby's red, uh, it's showing that there's 29 parts per million in, in, the, uh, in the baby, in the mother, sorry, and 5.6 of the haemoglobin is carboxylated. So it's a really powerful tool um, and particularly a visual tool for the pregnant mum to really articulate, I suppose, the, uh, the effect of her choice on the baby. Uh, so it is a way that, that certain uh, health services, particularly within Victoria, uh, will also look uh, at assessing or identifying people who smoke as well as using the multiple choice format earlier. So I just wanted to, to now, I suppose, uh, do a few things around uh, smoking generally uh, before going uh, back into the maternal uh, space. But I think it's important as health professionals that we really remember that people who smoke are not just trying to annoy us. They're not just trying to stand out the front of the hospital looking really bad for the health service. They're not just going off the ward and, and not being available for allied health or medical review. Um, that the reason that they smoke is complex. Okay, they've got a dependency, they've got an addiction to nicotine and they've also got all these behaviours and the relationship between their moods and emotions that have built up over years and years and years of smoking. When we look at nicotine dependence, um, it really is a chronic medical condition and we need to see it like that. So again, thinking about within your health service, do we often put smoking in the lifestyle section? Do we put it in the social history? Why are we not putting it in the medical history? Okay, it is a medical condition. We need to look at it through that lens. That person needs support to manage that dependency, support to quit smoking. And it is well and truly under recognised by health professionals, certainly across Victoria, um, and I would say no doubt across Australia. Just like any other medical condition, assessment's important. So I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things for you with respect to probably one of the biggest uh, barriers and one of the biggest um, uh, things that people who smoke will tell you. 
And generally that is, I smoke and it makes me feel better, it relieves, st sorry, relieves stress, um, it improves my mood, it improves my concentration. And I just want for a moment wanted to challenge that with you. So what we know is when you have a drag on a cigarette, within about 30 seconds, nicotine reaches a really important part of the brain and it binds to acetylcholine receptors. And that happens really quickly. And because that happens really quickly, there is a dopamine release. Small dopamine, but significant dopamine release uh, within the brain. So for the person who smokes, they think, hey, I've just had a drag, I feel great because we know that dopamine improves mood, improves concentration, uh, improves alertness and so forth. But what we know is because nicotine doesn't hang around long in the body, it has that short half-life, it can't actually sit on that acetylcholine receptor for very long and that dopamine release does not hang around for very long. So the dopamine starts dropping off, the person starts going into withdrawal, so what do they do? They pick up another cigarette to reverse that withdrawal. So when they say it makes me feel less stressed, it improves my concentration, it's actually because all it's doing is reversing the withdrawal. It's reversing that crapness that they were feeling, how bad they were feeling. So when we look a few months down the track, particularly in people who have pre-existing mental illness, depression, so forth, they have a significant improvement in their mood and levels of anxiety. So again, when we look at assessing nicotine dependency during pregnancy, it's a little bit different to how we would do it within uh, the general population. And it's because really we know that many women reduce their cigarettes per day, so we know that, that standard measures may be less effective. So there's some data out around considering using what we call strengths of urges to smoke and frequency of urges to smoke scales. So it's asking things like, in general, how strong have the urges to smoke been in the last 24 hours? Slight, moderate, strong, very strong, extremely strong. And obviously the higher they are on that scale, the more likely they are to have a higher dependence. And also, how much of the time have you felt an urge to smoke in the past 24 hours? Not at all, a little of the time, some of the time, a lot, almost all of the time and all of the time. So it's a little bit different in this population. Um, so again, reflecting on what's happening within your clinical practices, within your health service and, and if there's room to, to make some changes. Also, when you're thinking about someone who can't smoke, who has quit smoking or perhaps might be uh, in an inpatient bed and, and not be able to get out to smoke, they're going to feel pretty crap and the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal kind of kick in pretty quickly um, and they're things like dizziness, changes in concentration, changes in appetite, mood and so forth. And we know that these symptoms come on strong and they come on strong within the first day or two. So quite often as health professionals, um, you know, we, we think, oh, it's too much for the patient at the moment, they've got so much going on, I'll wait, you know, a couple of days and then I'll talk to them about smoking but we actually need to manage it because that's when they're going to be in the worst of the withdrawal. That's likely when they're going to be taking themselves out the front of the hospital to have their cigarette. And we know that when we look long term at these withdrawal symptoms, uh, they usually go away in a few weeks and the use of medicine can support that. So I think I just wanted to kind of finish off what's current state in Australia at the moment. And a recent survey published just last year in the MGA showed uh, when talking to GPs and obstetricians, 25% um, of them never prescribed nicotine replacement therapy or medicine to support a quit attempt. And that, that's been replicated in findings in the UK, the US um, and also in New Zealand. And the barriers that, that, that obstetricians and GPs cite is low confidence in their ability to prescribe and also concerns about safety. And this particular um, paper by Barzim actually sums up all the international guidelines uh, for the use of something like nicotine replacement therapy in pregnancy. The key message of this is there is just a huge amount of inconsistency. There are some countries like New Zealand who will say NRT is safer than smoking, women may use it. And then there would be some countries where they would say current evidence is insufficient. So again, there's this huge kind of barrier around provision of nicotine replacement therapy to pregnant women uh, who smoke. So we know it reduces the motivation to smoke. We know it minimises withdrawal symptoms. We know that it has a minimum addictive potential and not a whole lot of side effects. 
Um, but when it comes to pregnancy, there's still a whole lot of stuff we don't know. We know that evidence is limited and we know that there's only been a small number of studies and a small number of participants. And we know that nicotine replacement therapy does have an effect on maternal blood pressure, pulse, fetal heart rate um, and various other indexes, but at a rate similar to smoking. And when we look at animal studies, nicotine has been shown to be harmful to the fetus, but we don't know how that translates to humans. And there's been a few observational studies uh, where there's been no significant risk to the mum or to the baby by the use of N uh, NRT. And again, a couple of randomised controlled trial trials where again, uh, it shows both, both safety and efficacy, but the data is limited. The limitations of these studies are also that these trials use a fixed regimen of nicotine replacement therapy regardless of how much the person smokes and their dependency. And it goes back to what I said before that we know that pregnant women have a higher rate of metabolism. So you would think that they would need higher doses than the general population, which they're not getting in these studies. We also know that pregnant women don't tend to use nicotine replacement therapy enough of it, enough dose of it, doses of it and for long enough. And none of these studies titrated what we call a clinic to, according to clinical response. So they just got all thrown the same thing and then they measured what happens, which we don't do with anything else. Imagine just everyone getting the same dose of an antihypertensive. It's just, when it comes to maternity and nicotine replacement therapy, we just don't have the data yet. And I think that's important. It's not that we're saying that it's not effective. We're not saying that. We just don't have the data yet to say that it definitely works and that it's definitely safe. The Royal Women's Hospital in Victoria produces the Pregnancy and Breastfeeding Medicine Guide and they have a really pragmatic approach. So they pretty much say, we know that there's not a lot of information available. Wherever possible, we want to support pregnant women to smoke using non-pharmacological strategies, counselling, behavioural support. There's even some evidence out now around financial incentives. Uh, but let's consider it in people who have failed to quit using these other strategies use the lowest effective dose and use intermittent forms, so things like the gum, the lozenges, the mouth spray, the inhalator and so forth. And there is no data uh, at the moment around the use of the two prescription medicines for supporting smoking cessation, so things like Champix or Zyvan. So just to finish up, I think you know when we're looking at this, uh, there isn't clear guidance, but looking at it pragmatically, what are our key points? Well, wherever possible, we want to manage medical conditions in pregnancy without medicine. Okay? If we don't have the opportunity to do that, uh, with a risk versus benefit discussion between uh, mum, between you know, the GP if it's shared care or the obstetrician or, or whoever it might be, um, consider the use of something like nicotine replacement therapy. They need to use it regularly enough as a substitute for cigarettes. And also patches might just be an option, particularly for those pregnant women who may experience nausea. The duration of use, we need to use it for at least 12 weeks, but we can look at using it longer if a person's at risk of relapse. They need to have regular reviews, they need to have behavioural support. Consider the use of carbon monoxide monitoring, particularly if they've quit to help actually demonstrate you know, where they were at baseline when the baby was red to, to where they are now and, and, and the baby's green and got that much lower um, carbon monoxide. And also consider the opportunities um, to bring or keep this on the agenda because we know that a lot of um, mums do relapse postpartum. So I think it's not something that ends when the baby's born. We need to, to keep that discussion open. Um, that's it for me. Um, so not, nowhere near as clear cut in this space as it is uh, in smoking cessation in the general population. Um, but I think you know it, it's like the use of all medicines in pregnancy um, that we have to weigh up that risk versus benefit, and it, and it is that joint decision making between um, the, the medical professionals involved in that pregnant woman's care um, and also uh, the pregnant woman herself. Hi. Thank you very much. My name is Sabila. I'm from the Pharmacy Theatre. And we also have, working with us, we've got the Pharmacy Policy Drug Staff. And I just wanted to know what you guys are 
So the, the question was around the ongoing costs for staff, so supporting staff. Okay, so I suppose for, for us, uh, the cost for staff, um, providing them uh, support for quitting smoking um, was really a, a part of kind of what we did. We have a, a really big, uh, I suppose, approach to, to health and wellbeing within uh, our organisation. So originally we looked at just uh, uh, doing it with a few of our staff, um, seeing what kind of success rates we would get and then to be able to pull that business case together to be able to put to our organisation to say, if we invest this, this is what we can expect to get. Um, we're also very lucky in that our approach to smoke free encompasses lots of different parts of the organisation. So we have strong support from our executive, we have strong support from our pharmacy department, from our population health unit. So what we found for us worked really well was that when a whole lot of areas contributed a little bit of money um, and to be able to trial these things, um, it got off the ground so much easier. So just to give you an idea, the provision of support to our staff, and, and we have, you know, a, a several hundred kind of come through a year, costs us in the vicinity about kind of 20k a year. So the cost of the organisation um, certainly is there and is a consideration, but my advice would always be around, you know, making sure that what you're doing is, is best practice, measuring outcomes to be able to feed back um, to get that continually on the radar. The same thing with our support for, for patients. We integrated the approach within existing interactions. So we have uh, one EFT who was Linda, who was on the video, who really coordinates our patient approach to smoke free. Um, but we were really lucky that the pharmaceutical budget um, for the provision of nicotine replacement therapy was just picked up by the organisation. And again, uh, we just made sure that along the way we fed back you know, our performance in that space and kept it on that radar so that, that people were, were happy that that kept being done. Um, I didn't put it in this particular presentation, but there's so much evidence to show that if you clinically manage people and prevent them going into nicotine withdrawal, there's a decrease in patient towards pa patient and patient towards staff violence. So I think you know putting it in that type of um, frame where every health service wants to maximise patient outcomes and minimise you know staff risk and occupational violence was powerful for us to be able to say well we know that there's a link here let's do this and we know that we're most likely to experience less clinical aggression than if we don't clinically manage and uh, support people in withdrawal. Sorry, just to follow up. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, certainly for us, um, we just have a really robust process with our patients. We have just one mailbox where all our staff will email in and we'll email out to them to ask where they're at. So we've got a series of tobacco treatment specialists within our organisation that do that. Um, but my advice for other organisations is to utilise services that are free or already in place. So for health services in Victoria that don't have tobacco treatment specialists, and most of them don't, uh, part of their approach, if we're going to fund you with medication, is that you need to be involved in behavioural support. And that might be through quit line and so forth. And then that service feeds back to you where they're at. Okay, so as a referrer to Quitline, um, certainly in Victoria, I uh, will get feedback on, on where they're at. Um, so I think sometimes our tendency is to try and take it on all of ourselves as an organisation, but my advice would be to look at those services that are already in place that you can leverage off. Um, and my advice would always be to, to use a combination of that behavioural support and, and medication because you get by far the best quit rates. Anyone on BC got a question? Yeah, Carnarvon, can we ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, for those health services that perhaps don't have the funding, or the backup to, to um, do nicotine replacement therapy, I'm just thinking about our campus where we have big smoke-free signs all over the front benches where everyone happily sits and smokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's been let go. How? Any hints for overturning something like that, or to, you know, changing the culture? 
Um, I, everyone will have heard that question, yeah, because it's come through VC. Good, I don't have to repeat it. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, I get this question all the time and they say, oh, uh, how do we get nicotine replacement therapy on our impress? How do we get access to it? And I think this is a dependency. So take smoking cessation out, out of the equation for a second and think about a patient coming to your service in withdrawal whether it be alcohol, whether it be drug, whether it be nicotine. Why are we having such a debate about why should this happen? We, patients come in with alcohol dependency, they get an alcohol withdrawal scale, they get offered diazepam, thiamine, other supplemental therapy, and it just happens. But for tobacco and for smoking, we, we tend to think we need to make a case. So my argument is less around why that should be the case and trying to draw the parallels between other things. This is a, a clinical dependency. Yes, we want to support cessation, but we actually have a patient in the bed that is going to withdraw unless we support them. So it's a clinical issue that we should be doing regardless of whether or not as an organisation where, where we've got services in place for, for pro-smoking cessation. I think when it comes to, to non-compliance, um, again, it, it, it's really difficult. Smoke-free is really hard. It requires structural policy culture change. So it's not something that you're going to be able to tick a box and, and go, done, we can move on. Um, but I think it's about you as an organisation using the leverage points, using what your organisation cares about um, to get this back on the agenda. So it might be within, you know, if you've got people smoking out in front of your health service, um, you know, what kind of uh, brand or what, how does that affect your brand as a health service? So I think one of the biggest things that I've learned in this journey is that you have to have your argument tailored to your audience. So if I'm talking to our executive and our board, it's around the things that they care about. If I'm talking to surgeons, it's around, you know, ensuring that their patients have the lowest possible risk from surgery. So my conversations with them are, are evidence heavy. If I'm talking to our mental health unit, it's around inequality and, and, and the argument around it's really important that there is equality in quitting within their mental health settings. So I think we, we've got to change the dialogue, shift the dialogue, not to be so much why we should do it, but why should we actually not? Um, and remembering that this is a clinical issue. Um, so as an organisation, as a health service, it is not okay for us to force people into withdrawal, whatever it might be. We need to manage that. It's treatable, it's preventable, and it's modifiable. That's good. Any other questions? Anyone else from VC? No? Is that a... Yeah. Hello. It's um, Jenny from the South West. Um, very aware that um, the Cancer Council WA ceased the delivery of Fresh Start, which was a form of group therapy, um, and I, I understand that it was evaluated and and viewed not to have been that effective. You, you did refer earlier to group therapy. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in what form that took and how effective that's been proven, um, and has that been part of your smoking cessation clinics that you've been holding in-house? Uh, so at the moment, uh, uh, we've only been doing group uh, sessions within our staff uh, cohort, um, and that's been uh, at the request of staff. So particularly within our outpatient clinic, it is all individual. We are looking towards the opportunity for, for group base. Group based support requires a very different skill mix of the, the person facilitating those sessions. Um, at the moment, we only have a few staff who have those skills. Um, but when you look at um, data from the Cochrane Review, actually group therapy or group consultations are actually more effective by one percentage point than individuals. Um, but again, it relies on, on the facilitator. So I think um, we haven't had any statistical significance difference in whether or not we provided our staff individual support or group support, um, but particularly for our staff in areas where there were high levels of smoking, so particularly our IT department, our security team, um, they wanted group support. They wanted to be able to do it together. They wanted to band together and rally that support from each other. So um, they actually walk all the way across the road to Faulkner Park at the moment. Um, and instead of taking their cigarettes, they take their nicotine sprays and they all stand there spraying together. It's pretty cute. Um, but, um, but I think 
you know, certainly, um, you know, group consultations are, are, co are more cost effective, um, but, uh, but making sure that you have the right person to facilitate them. I can't really comment on, on the fresh start and um, the, the evidence there, um, but certainly um, from the literature, it's a, a really great way to be able to provide, you know, effective um, and relatively cost effective behavioural support.